get right started. So good morning and welcome everyone to Charlottesville, to the University of Virginia, and to this amazing event celebrating a brilliant scholar, a mentor, and to many of us. We are all here today to recognize and to honor Sarah Hunter and her indelible impact on all of us as scholars and as teachers. Historians of black feminist history have excavated and have expanded the complexities of African American women's lives. In so doing, historians have offered dramatic reassessments of transformations in American and African American culture, politics, economics, and social life. Within this vibrant tradition of groundbreaking scholarship, few works have been as influential in this endeavor as Tara Hunter's award-winning book, To Joy My Freedom, Southern Black Women's Lives and Labors After the Civil War. To Joy My Freedom dramatically shaped subsequent analyses in an array of areas by providing new insight into the contours of black feminist political consciousness, black women's representation, white supremacist violence, and black social life in the post-bellum era. Into Joy, Black working class women emerged as actors through which to rethink major shifts in Southern cultural and political history and as agents in contesting white supremacist <coughs> control over African Americans' lives in post bellum America, Atlanta. Excuse me. And so far as the symposium engages to join my freedom's impact in shaping black feminist history's form and methodological approach, we are also here to highlight new developments in the field and to celebrate the influence that Tara's work has had on her. So, instead of merely reflecting upon To Joy My Freedom itself, this anniversary of its 1997 publication presents a unique opportunity for forward-looking consideration of the generative dynamism of the field by featuring the work and thoughts of scholars of black women's history. Today, we will hear from scholars who have worked directly with Tara and have been under her tutelage and mentorship. In reflecting on our own scholarship, we will be celebrating not only To Joy My Freedom, but also the publication of Tara's newest book, Bound in Wedlock, This book is already shaped not only how we think about African-American familial life in the 19th century, but also the arguments about black marriage in the 20th and 21st. So today, we will be delving into a variety of themes, each in some way connected to the amazing work that Tara has done and the work that she continues to do. And also a note about the schedule, we will be having a dinner at 5.30 in the Colonnade Club, everyone here is welcome, and I encourage everyone here to attend to continue the festivities into the evening. So to begin this day of celebration and fellowship, we will hear from the honored guest herself. She will be in conversation with Deborah McDowell, the director of the Carter G. <coughs> Institute for African American and African Studies. Please join me in welcoming Tara Hunter and Deborah McDowell. Try the other one, perhaps. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. 
and uh, as I said yesterday, it was plain to anyone with one eye open and one eye closed that Tara was destined for greatness. So we started hanging out, or I should say, I started riding shotgun. <laughs> so, Tara helped me move into the house I've been occupying for 30 years. And uh, at the end of the day of moving things around, maybe I think we even painted that day, I can't remember. We had a picnic in the backyard with a colleague of mine, an intern, who has since gone on. And the uh, following week, my neighbors had a party to welcome me to the neighborhood. So my next door neighbor says, uh, Debra, where's your husband? I said, I don't have a husband. She says, oh, well I was looking out the kitchen window last week and I thought I saw you, your husband, and your little girl. <laughs> My little girl was terrible. <laughs> so ever since then, I have referred to Tara as my little girl. <laughs> anyway, yes. so to look back on your arrival at the Woodson Institute as a graduate student from Yale, uh, what was your conception of to joy my freedom then? Uh, it's kind of a three-part question. Uh, how did it evolve during the course of the fellowship tenure? And what were the greatest challenges you faced in writing the book? Okay. So I think when I arrived, I had some very general ideas about what I wanted to do with this book. Um, I knew that I wanted to write, well, a dissertation at that stage, I wanted to write about African American women, working class women, domestic workers. I had gone to graduate school with a mission um, as an undergraduate, I wrote a senior thesis on Charlotte Hawkins Brown, who's a middle class African American woman, educator, um, involved in a lot of social reform activities. And I kind of had my feel with middle, the middle class. And I really wanted to explore how do you write about working class women. And so that was kind of my mission going into graduate school. And I explored the topic through different papers, trying to figure out, should I approach it politically? Should I approach it through social history, intellectual history? And so I wrote a paper for David Montgomery's um, labor history seminar on the washerwomen strike. And so that, that became my entree into figuring out how to write about working class women. And so um, the thing about domestic workers, there is this sort of long body of um, kind of scholarship, social science work, going back to the late 19th century. But most of that literature really was less interested in domestic workers as people, much more interested in looking at them in terms of how they impacted the middle class more. So basically those studies were really more about um, these women as appendages for studying the middle class. And the exception to that rule was, you know, some, some of the the literature that was emerging um, written by women of color scholars, so women of color writing about Latina um, domestic workers, Asian American domestic workers, um, African American women domestic workers. And so those studies started to really broach the issue of who are these women as people? You know, of course look at their, them as workers, but also look at other aspects of their lives. But I still felt like there was a lot that had not been written about these women as women, as mothers, as sisters, as neighbors. Um, and so that was really what I came, <coughs> came into um, the Woodson Institute to try to, to, to do. And I um, have to acknowledge Armstead Robinson, who was the director of the Institute at the time. Um, and when he called to offer me the fellowship, it's a two-year fellowship, you know, I was concerned about, you know, how am, I, how am I going to do my research? I need to go to Atlanta. And he was very generous in saying, look, you know, you have two years. You can come in October instead of September. So he basically gave me the flexibility of starting the fellowship a little bit later so that I could go to Atlanta, I could do the research. And so I came um, in, you know, later in the fall, armed with having spent several months in Atlanta. I think I spent about three months 
previously I had done short trips to Atlanta and other parts of the South. So I came in with having called um, the archives, especially the Atlanta History <coughs> Center, and just my approach was really to look at all kinds of materials. And that was my, obviously my biggest challenge was, how do you write about women who haven't left archive? And one of the things I had to do was to, first of all, I had to have a strategy for approaching the archives because I realized that when you go to the archives and you tell people, well, I'm, I'm writing about domestic workers, they say, well, we don't have anything about domestic workers. <laughs> so that shuts down the conversation immediately. So I had to, you know, frame my research in such a way that I could get entree into seeing all kinds of sources. Um, and because sometimes archivists can be, they, they want to sort of shepherd you through. They don't necessarily want to open up things to allow you to explore in the way that you want to explore. And so I encountered those pushbacks at times. And so, um, so I came back with all kinds of things I didn't even know what I was going to do with. Um, records from money lenders, for example, which listed black women having borrowed you know, small sums of money from these men who were basically charging them exorbitant rates. And you know, it's in the book, but it, you know, it didn't amount to a whole lot. Um, so I had really interesting conversations with people when I was here. I remember distinctly one conversation with Eric Lott, who was um, at the time he was a postdoc, maybe. Yeah, not a postdoc. He was. He was. Uh, yeah, he was the pre-doc at, at the Woodson Institute. Yes, he was a pre-doc. He was finishing his dissertation okay. at Columbia. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Eric, um, who's a cultural critic, cultural, who does cultural studies, um, asked me some really interesting questions. He basically asked me something to the effect of, what are the quotidian aspects of these women's lives, or something like that, about their work, their lives, and I couldn't answer it directly. But that's exactly what I was wanting and hoping to do. But the way, and I, I'm not really capturing the way he posed the question, but the way he posed that question was really fruitful, because it really forced me to think about those exact terms in very specific ways. And it kind of set me off on this path in writing the dissertation of really trying to tease out, you know, what was it like to be a domestic worker? What was it like in their workspaces? You know, the laundry work that they were doing. What was it like, you know, in their homes? You know, and so that was a very formative question that I think really kind of um, helped me to write the dissertation that I wrote. Um, and then I think, for me, it was a layering process. Um, and I often tell this to my students and the people that I talk to about, um, you know, writing dissertations, writing books. Because when I finished the dissertation, that was stage one. So that was the platform for thinking about, okay, now what do I do next? How do I turn this into a book? And so given the difficulty of the research, it took me a lot just to get to that point where I had you know, sufficient uh, material to write a dissertation. Um, but I knew that there was much more that I could do. And so thinking about doing more research, but also one of the things I realized is um, I could actually revisit some of the sources that I had spent a lot of time so just to give you one example, I spent a lot of time reading um, the African American newspaper in Atlanta, which was a weekly newspaper. Spent a lot of time reading the Atlanta Constitution, which was a daily newspaper. That, that's another story. But the African American newspaper, I had read every issue because it was weekly and it was, you know, it was containable enough that I could actually read the whole thing. But I went back and I read it again, but I read it with fresh eyes. So sometimes you're looking for things, um, and you come across things you may not be looking for, but your focus may take you away from seeing other things. And so one of the things I realized as I was going back through is that I had missed a lot about leisure. Now, in the dissertation, there are sections on leisure, but as a result of going back through the newspaper, 
I was able to write basically two chapters. Um, and that was from, you know, just maybe because I was more familiar with the newspaper, I could take in more, I could see advertisements for leisure activities, I could see um, some of the articles around controversies about leisure activities in new ways. And so that really helped to transform the dissertation um, into a book in a different way. Another thing that was really helpful too was I, I gave it to lots of people to read. Some of you might be here, Robert <laughs> Kelly. Um, and, um, you know, I got feedback for like things you should think about and revising. Um, one of the people I gave it to was Nancy Hewitt. Unfortunately, she could not be here today. But um, one of the things that Nancy said was, um, can you comment on change over time? Well, one thing I would, and she said, you know, you don't really need to reorganize it. The dissertation was organized um, very thematically, though it moved chronologically. I think I was talking with Sarah about this, or Sarah, the other day we talked about this. Um, but what I realized is that I couldn't really comment on change over time without having the work organized in such a way that it moved more through time. And so what that forced me to do was to totally revamp the dissertation or the book manuscript. And so I totally reorganized it um, in such a way that I think the, it had a stronger narrative. Mm -hmm. I think that was the biggest difference. I think, you know, as we were talking last night, I think the other night I was trying to figure out what was different. I think it's that it created, it forced me to develop a stronger narrative about the you know, the changes and developments over time that were not as obvious in the way that I organized it the first time around. And to my surprise, um, and this is why I emphasize often it's, it's really important to, to think chronologically, though we don't have to be rigid in that way, but it, in doing that, it really, um, it forced me to juxtapose, for example, the strike. I had written about, you know, that's, that's where I started the project. I'd written so many versions of the chapter about the strike. I thought there was nothing new for me to say about that strike by the time I got to the point where I was writing the book. But once I reorganized the whole thing, um, I saw the strike in a different light because I started to talk more about well, what, what else is happening in the 1880s. And one of the things that was happening in the 1880s had to do with Republican Party activities that African Americans were involved in. It was like, oh, I had, I had sort of missed how important that context was to the strike. Um, because we think of, you know, Republican Party activities during Reconstruction, right? Once Reconstruction has ended, you know, we kind of forget about the work that's still being done politically before African Americans are disenfranchised and kicked out of the political so it's in that the 1880s where they were actually having an impact in the local politics. And the strike was happening in that context. So I'm just saying that to say that it really shed new light on topics that I thought I had exhausted by framing it in that way. Good. And so the layering process is really important. Good. That's a very, very rich uh, answer. Uh, I'm going to follow up um, with questions about narrative. Uh, when you talked about the book as it was, or the dissertation as it got revised into a book that you were more conscious of the importance of narrative. And I'd like to say, first of all, that reading the book again in uh, preparation for this conversation, uh, <laughs> I was reacquainted with the many joys it provides the reader, uh, not least its own creative energies and achievements. And among those achievements is a very clear narrative drive, which is really important to me as a literary scholar, uh, because I was able to see your appreciation for the kinds of narrative details that are most, it's not that they are only observed by literary scholars, but that literary scholars would find especially uh, appealing. You know, I go so far as to say that reading uh, To Joy My Freedom Again, 
reminded me that you are a historian come storyteller. <laughs> um, I was not surprised then to come upon uh, your own comments about what historians can learn from storytellers, uh, from the fiction writer's use of imagination, uh, constructing scenes as well as arguments. And so, can you say a little bit about uh, your fascination with narrative and with the conventions of storytelling? <laughs> Well, I was struck yesterday by Lynn's comment. Um, I think she said something like, um, it's also important to witness history. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that's what film does, right? That's what you, you guys are doing with your film, is you're helping us to witness history in a very creative way. I mean, partly through documentary, partly through thinking about it as art. Um, and I think as, as a historian, that's partly what I'm trying to do too, but I think storytelling is the way of doing that. And so for me, that's what I see my primary sort of motivating factor is, is telling the untold and the undertold stories. Um, that's my call. That's what I see as sort of, this is what makes me the scholar that I am, is that that's what I'm trying to do, ex excavate those stories and tell them, and I think the key is to tell them in a way that's interesting, compelling, um, and so, and that's why I do, you know, really value and try to study and think about how do fiction writers do that? How do they um, use their imaginations to capture the details to, because I think that history is sort of intrinsically interesting to people, which people have an interest in it, but we don't often tell the stories in a way that captures Right. Um, the readers. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what else did you learn about the historian's craft and the historian's practices in the process of writing to Joy My Freedom? Mm -hmm. Well, I think also, um, this continues on the question you just asked me to a certain extent. Um, I think sometimes historians are reluctant to use our imaginations. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think that is what really distinguishes us. We're not just collecting facts, right? We have to tell them in a way that is, is really interesting. Um, what was the other kind of question? Um, just anything else you learned about the historian's crap yeah. in the process. Right, and so the other part I was thinking about is also argument. So yes, we're telling stories, but we also have to have a point of view. And so we need to tell stories in such a way that we also connect those dots, yes. right? We have something that we want to say. We have an argument or arguments that we want to make. Mm -hmm. And so I think for me, learning how to make those two things work together, mm -hmm. to tell stories in such a way and to make arguments in such a way <laughs> that you draw the readers in, mm -hmm. you paint the pictures, you allow them to be witnesses, you allow them, you take them back as much as you can to that place, mm -hmm. to those people, to that moment, to those events. Mm -hmm. And I think over time, I got more comfortable with my writing. Uh -huh. Well, um, you should be. <laughs> <laughs> um, it seems to me that one of the numerous compelling arguments um, coming through in the book is um, the, I, I would argue, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, that this is perhaps a central argument um, about in, in the book, and that is that while black women's labor stood on the periphery, peripheries of the burgeoning <coughs> in the New South, their work was essential to its effective functioning. That's one of the arguments, it seems to me, or a com compelling argument you make. But in the process of making that argument, which comes through, and I tried to make this observation yesterday, what comes through uh, that is reinforced in the subtitle is that black women's work was not, their lives were not reducible to their work. That you seek to make a distinction between black women's lives and black women's labors, right? And so I'd like for you to elaborate a little bit about that distinction uh, that the <coughs> subtitle really does compel us to see uh, and a distinction that is made um, quite forcefully in the course of the 
Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think it was in your remarks yesterday that you bring up Sharon Harley's quote. Yes, yeah, I did. That your work is not who you are. Mm -hmm. Yes. And so really thinking about what that means for African American women mm -hmm. um, to want to be engaged in work that is often degrading, um, that is often you know underpaid, that is often, especially in the period of my book, mm -hmm. um, very close to the conditions of slavery mm -hmm. and the kind of struggles that they were engaged in to try to extract <laughs> from those circumstances. And so wanting to, to, yes, focus on work, because work is important, and because the domestic work that they did was important. So it, was, it really was essential to the economy of the New South. Um, the city could not get on without these women's work. So that it's kind of a contradiction, because Atlanta, for example, really saw itself as the model of the New South, meaning it was trying to you know, sort of think of itself, um, especially economically, as being more progressive, you know, moving more towards manufacturing and industrialization and all those things, but also at the same time clinging to the old self in terms of labor relations and domestic work being the primary way in which that continued to operate. Um, and so I wanted to, you know, really talk about the centrality of work, <coughs> of these women's work and the importance to the economy, but also to talk about them as human beings. Um, and to see them in their neighborhoods, to see them in the organizations that they created. Um, and that goes back to what I was saying earlier in terms of how domestic workers were often not treated as mm -hmm. people. Yes. With mm -hmm. interests and... Um, people and with interests and people with interior lives. Um, that is also one of the most fascinating aspects of the project to me, and one that we can begin to <coughs> gently shift to bound in wedlock. One of the ones that, uh, aspects that it seems to me to follow through um, into bound in wedlock. Your investments in the interior lives of these women, your investments in knowing who they were, what they felt, how they thought, about their lives, how they thought about their experiences. And so I want to just have you think, uh, and you can choose whichever one of these terms you want, um, uh, joy, pleasure, <laughs> uh, freedom, uh, resistance. I would, it would be inaccurate to say that um, in your workings, in your hands, joy constitutes uh, a form of resistance. That would be a bit simplistic, but not entirely uh, inaccurate, right? And so if we can conceive of joy for these women as a form of resistance, what, how, would you, how would you talk about that? Would that be fair to, to, to argue? Yes, I think it's fair. Um, I mean, I see joy as something that's internal, right? So I think of it as something that, uh, I may get this song wrong, but you know that song, um, what the world didn't give you, the world can't take away? Mm -hmm. That's what joy is, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know? So mm -hmm. it's something that no one else can do for you, no one can take away from you. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's what joy meant to these women. Mm -hmm. So the title of the book, To Joy My Freedom, mm -hmm. right? It's about to enjoy, um, but it's about, and you, you pointed this out yesterday as well, it's about to joy, which is an exclamation, a declaration. Um, and a destination. Right. <laughs> yeah. and it's, it's an exercise. It's, mm -hmm. it's you know, of, of something. Um, and so that is a powerful form of resistance yeah. for people coming out of slavery to be able to um, basically have a sense of autonomy, to be able to claim their bodies, to be able to um, demand respect, to be able to ask for pay for the work that they were doing. Those were forms of resistance. Um, and I see pleasure as an expression of joy. Mm -hmm. So the pleasure comes in how do these women and men, how do they express their joy? And they do that in multiple ways. Mm -hmm. They do that um, usually outside of the workplace, but you know, even within the community of doing laundry work, there was pleasure in that because it was something that they were able to control 
in their own neighborhoods, in their own homes. So the pleasure of women and girls, um, you know, the camaraderie that developed, the gossip that took place, um, the exchange of information, the conflicts, you know, all of those things happening constituted pleasure. And then the pleasure, obviously, outside of their work lives. Um, you know, strolling down the street, dressing up, um, engaging in church activities, going to the dance halls. Spraying um, the mistress's perfume. Right. <laughs> yeah. So those were acts of resistance because their employers wanted them to literally dedicate their lives to work and work only. Mm -hmm. And so that becomes very clear in the controversies about dance. Yes. Like, why are you going to dance in your own time? <laughs> when you should be resting and right. recuperating for work. So you can watch So that your outside. body is basically doing the labor um, that benefits other people. Mm -hmm. Like that's that's your whole yes. entire yes. reason for being. Yeah, the beginning and end of your being. Uh -huh. Well, shifting just slightly, um, or gently, to bound in wedlock, uh, which is uh, not surprisingly enjoying high praise as the first comprehensive history of African American marriage in the 19th century. Um, as I suggested a minute ago, I can readily see how to join my freedom might have led you logically uh, to write bounded wedlock, um, to reduce each to its least common denominator. I didn't get to talk about this in my remarks yesterday, but I had written a few notes about love as well, and that your books are defined, or we could suggest that the organizing concepts of each of your books is, um, is emotional, all right, is in the realm of the emotional joy <laughs> on the one hand and love uh, on the other. How do you see the relation between these two projects mm -hmm. in that regard? So, first of all, um, the book came about when I was doing, like the last stretch of research that I was doing on in revising To Joy My Freedom, um, I went to the um, the Freedmen and Southern Society Project at the University of Maryland, and fortunately Leslie Rowley couldn't be here today, but um, she generously allowed me to go there because it's basically they've collected all these documents that they've been edited and published in book form, which is the most amazing, amazing documentary history project in U.S. history, but that's another story. But anyway, I went there um, basically looking for documents that I could, you know, add to the book. And, but as I was going through a lot of the records, I kept coming across um, these documents related to marriage. Mm -hmm. To family generally, but especially to marriage. And I talk in the book about family and marriage during the Reconstruction period. So some of those documents are represented there, but what I was really struck by was the kind of the level of emotion in those documents that I didn't see in the, in the secondary literature. Um, the ways in which African Americans were talking about their relationships, the ways especially men were talking about their love for their nephews or their nieces. You know, there was a, a letter, I think I cited in To Joy My Freedom, of, I often teach it, of, of a man who's, he's disconnected, he's lost from his, his, his sister. They've been separated um, after the Civil War, during the Civil War, and he's trying to contact her and he writes her a letter and says, send me a lock of her hair, meaning his, um, his niece. So that kind of affection, that kind of tenderness, we don't often see represented in the discussions about African American men mm -hmm. and what, what they feel about mm -hmm. their family. So part of it was also thinking about gender and thinking about um, the emotional realm. You know, men get reduced to the kind of you know roles that they play, mm -hmm. the economic role especially, and and then just being drawn to <clears throat> the the complicatedness of marriage mm -hmm. and people trying to you know reunite with their spouses or 
um, separate from their spouses or um, the kinds of conflicts that they had that they were trying to negotiate via agents of the Freedmen's Bureau and missionaries. And so initially I put those records aside because I had collected a lot of them thinking I would do an article on reconstruction and marriage. <laughs> So after I finished the book, I went on, to, I was working on something completely different. And then I came back to this topic of marriage, um, <clears throat> largely because of, I had a conversation with my editor, Joy Seltzer, and we were talking about this marriage issue. And it was through that conversation that I decided to write a book instead of an article. And to think about marriage, not just in the Reconstruction period, but really what I was trying to do is to figure out how can we fully understand what's happening in that period um, without going back and looking at slavery. Like what insights can we learn from slavery by looking at what happens afterwards? But you know, sort of being able to trace fully um, how African Americans were negotiating with their marriages. Um, what, it, what did it mean? What did it mean to not have legal recognition? What were the consequences for that? And then also to be able to trace it towards the end of the 19th century, mm -hmm. at the you know the very end of the 19th century. So that's really the, the book really kind of grew out of um, to join my freedom. Um, I think it's it's also my continuing interest in the working class is still there um, in the the new book in terms of you know it's it's about slaves, it's about ex slaves, it's about Free African Americans, um, most of whom were working class, um, and it's, you know it's about class dynamics across um, within the African American community as well. Um, it's not just about women in the way that um, To Joy My Freedom really centered women, but at the same time, it is the women are still very central um, in Bowling Wetlock. <coughs> um, but obviously, marriage is you know falls women and men, so it's a, it's about it's more about gender in terms of thinking about um, the nature of those relationships, the gender nature mm -hmm. of marriage and what it meant for both mm -hmm. women and men. Mm -hmm. uh, even as I invoke love to talk about marriage, um, obviously we know there are loveless marriages. <laughs> so it's not that, but I, I think most people in marriages at least Assuming that there, if there is a love to start, perhaps love will grow. <laughs> anyway, uh, but it, it, it occurs to me that what is operating in Bound and Wetlock is a much more complex view of love than we typically um, acknowledge. That is, for many of us, ideas of love are reducible to romantic love. But it seems to me that you are dealing with love as a complex and historicized phenomenon in Boundary Wedlock. So can you talk a little bit about that uh, and how it connects to black people's ideas about marriage? Mm -hmm. Well, I think it, you know, I try to deal with it in terms of the romantic aspects as well as the not so romantic aspects. Um, because the romantic aspects have also been emphasized mm -hmm. or denied or um, <laughs> ignored. Um, you know, so a lot of the, you know, marriage has been sort of assumed in the way we've talked about it in much of the literature. It's, it's kind of there, it's in the context of the family that historians have talked about it with respect to African Americans, but it hasn't necessarily been questioned mm -hmm. or poked and prodded to really figure out what did it mean. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes I feel like the, the, the romantic aspects have been denied because, you know, for African Americans who, was, who were enslaved, you know, how can you imagine a romantic life for if you were a slave? When in fact, um, if you read the slave narratives, the slave narratives of alone are very clear about how romantic their feelings were. Oh, yes. People um, would walk 30 miles a night to go and see a partner in a, a, a plantation for mm -hmm. a way to walk back again. Right. Right. Yeah, so right. obviously. Right, so I, I definitely wanted to capture the romantic aspects of it. But it's also very complicated because 
Um, love is also having to be created and fostered and nurtured in the context of severe constraints. Mm -hmm. um, and so what happens when your love is disrupted? What happens when your love cannot be fully realized? Um, so, yeah, wanted to feel about that. Uh -huh. Wonderful. Um, what surprises did you uncover among this vast a body of source materials. I, I do recall when you were writing the dissertation that you were working with a dearth of sources and therefore having to, as you suggested, uh, approach the idea of source material much more creatively. But here in Bowden Wedlock, you're dealing with an abundance of sources. Uh, and so what surprises did you uncover among this vast body of material and um, what forced you to change or take the book in a direction that you may not have intended because you've talked very compellingly in other interviews about the ways in which you like to follow the sources that you do not wish to impose on the sources or distort them to fit some preconceived notions that you may have, but rather you want to follow the sources where they <coughs> Well, I think, um, so to answer your question about what was maybe the most surprising, or maybe maybe I underestimated, um, was thinking about free blacks. I think we have not really paid enough attention to free blacks mm -hmm. in terms of their daily lives. Mm -hmm. And I mean like ordinary free blacks, mm -hmm. not the famous Frederick Douglass's and the elites, but like ordinary free blacks in the South as well as in the North. And so one of the things I, really, I was really struck by was the difficulty that free black people had in maintaining their marriages. Because you would just assume that because they were free, mm -hmm. that they would be, their marriages would be unencumbered. Mm -hmm. um, and I real, but what I learned is how much that was not true. Mm -hmm. Like their marriages were very much encumbered by the fact that they were black. Um, to the point that it didn't, they weren't guaranteed even the right to marry. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I, I talk about um, some of the very racist um, judicial cases mm -hmm. where, you know, Supreme Court justices in the South are basically articulating this very argument that free blacks have no rights. Mm -hmm. You know, this is before Dred Scott. Free blacks have no rights, including the right to marry. Like, they're not guaranteed anything. And so that was an actual um, encumbrance that they had to deal with. And then, of course, you have free blacks married to slaves. Mm -hmm. And I think we've underestimated how many free blacks were actually married to slaves. Mm -hmm. I mean, their, their marriages were more like slave marriages yes. because uh -huh. they could, you know, they were not about to be legally recognized mm -hmm. either. Um, so I think that's probably the, where I was most surprised. Mm -hmm. um, the sources that sort of forced themselves on me were the legal sources. Mm -hmm. um, I had no idea how much the law was going to play in this project when mm -hmm. I first started it. And so um, beginning the project, um, thinking about, well, let's just say the first time I sat down to write a chapter, the first chapter that I wanted to write was the first chapter, which is now the first chapter in the book. And I sat down to write that chapter and I realized I couldn't really write that chapter because I couldn't answer a basic question, which was, what was slave law with respect to marriage? Um, the literature was very misleading, the secondary literature, because there were some historians who suggested that there were actual laws against slaves getting married. There was you know, statutes that prohibited slaves from getting married. So I had a research assistant, and I sent her out, go find all these statutes. So was this Margaret Burnham? No, I'm going to come back to Margaret Burnham. Oh, okay. Sorry. So Margaret Burnham did not say this. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I had this research assistant, and she came out. She came back with, you know, all these <laughs> copies of rings of microfilm of these statutes, and I'm looking through statute like page after page, and I'm like, there are no laws in here <laughs> related to slave marriage. What's like something's missing? And then I went back to Margaret Burnham's article. Margaret Burnham was a legal scholar, historian, lawyer wrote a piece about slave families and slave law. Slave law and family law. Right. Um, and so I went back to that article 
and I read it again. And then I, I noticed in the footnotes, <laughs> she, has, she makes a statement which should not have been a footnote, it should have been in the, in the body of the article. She says that basically slave law was not statutory. It was common law. So it wasn't that laws were passed against slaves being allowed to marry. It was that judges basically um, made arguments for why slaves could not be legally married. So in other words, cases would come before the courts, criminal cases, civil cases. And somehow or another, the question of slave marriage would come up in the case. And then the judge would have to say, well, is this legitimate? Can the slave be married? So it might come up in a case where a slave man has murdered his wife's lover. And the judge is trying to decide if his spouse should, can be forced to testify against him or not. Does spousal recusal apply to slaves? So then they have to articulate, um, are, slave, are slaves under the same laws? Can they, are their marriages um, legal? And of course they always said no. But that's how the law was articulated in criminal cases and civil cases. Um, so it wasn't that they couldn't be married in terms of laws prohibiting them as much as they were allowed to marry informally. And the, and the cases are, are very clear about that. They, they make a distinction between de facto marriage and de jure marriage. And so I'm saying all of this to say that that took me on a journey that I didn't expect. Uh -huh. Deep into the law, deep into antebellum court cases, and also postbellum court cases. So the law plays a much bigger role in the book than I had imagined. Mm -hmm. Policy, you know, policy debates during the Civil War in Congress, um, in the Confederacy. Um, those were not what I had imagined initially. Okay, wonderful. You suggested that this book is as much about the present state of the discourse <coughs> on black family as it is about the past. Uh, can you elaborate? <coughs> so partly in writing the book, I was interested in obviously the topic of marriage and trying to um, understand what did marriage mean to African Americans over the course of this long century. Um, but part of it was also motivated by some of the debates that were happening um, among sociologists and you know, political pundits where they often refer to slave marriage or slavery as an explanation for explaining present day circumstances. Um, and so people have argued that, for example, um, the low rate of marriage today among African Americans, which is roughly around 30%, um, is a product of slavery. You know, nothing could be further from the truth. Um, so I was very interested in basically doing the work to push back against those kinds of arguments that slavery had its own issues and problems that it produced for African Americans, <coughs> obviously, um, with respect to marriage. But by 1900, African Americans are married nearly universally. So how do we get from near universal marriage in 1900 to 2017, where marriage is like 30%, right? That's not about slavery. That's about something else. Mm -hmm. And so my book really um, comments on that. And I've had, you know, Rob and I had conversations about this. You know, like, how do you deal with those debates? Mm -hmm. You know, how do you write a book about the 19th century, um, but then deal with these, state, you know, debates about the 20th century and the 21st century? And ultimately, what I decided to do was to put it in, primarily, it's in the epilogue. Mm -hmm. So in the epilogue, I talk about. Um, I make my argument for why it's problematic to <coughs> attach slavery as the reason for low rates of marriage today. And so we see over the course of the 20th century how marriage rates start to decline for African Americans. And it, but it really starts around 1940. The 1940s is when we see 
um, a racial divide growing between black race and white race. The other thing is, in 1900, African Americans are marrying slightly more than whites mm -hmm. because they're marrying younger than whites. Um, and so how do we get from that to today? And so it starts in the 1940s with the GI Bill giving a positive boost to, to white marriage rates. African Americans were denied the benefits by and large. There were some veterans who benefited, but most did not to the degree that they deserved. So it boosted white, and it was designed partly to do that. I mean, that was the whole purpose of the GI Bill was to bring those men back, get them settled, resettled into civilian life, married, educated, give them jobs, give them resources for businesses, etc. It did that extremely well. Um, so we have a middle class in this country as a result of the GI Bill. Um, we can't say that enough. Um, and then other things were happening that were negative in terms of driving down marriage rates for African Americans. And one of the biggest things was permanent unemployment. So permanent unemployment starts to grow in the 1940s, decade by decade. And it's gotten worse and worse and worse ever since. Permanent meaning you're kicked out of the economy. You can't get a job. Not chronically, you, you know, you're in and out. You're permanently kicked out. Employment patterns and especially men's employment patterns and um, marriage rates are very closely correlated. So it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a historical fact, mm -hmm. you know, it's for as long as we have data. Um, and then we have, you know, we have mass incarceration. That's another driving force, <coughs> you know, in terms of sending especially men off to jail, um, reducing the number of men in communities. Um, so a lot of, you know, and then there are cultural changes that are driving marriage down in general for people across race. Um, but the disparities have grown over time, post 1940s, post 1960s. And so that's part of the conversation that the book entertains. Mm -hmm. um, I want to check in with the organizers because obviously I could just go on and on and on in this conversation. And I have many more questions because the work is so rich that it generates all these questions. How many more minutes do I have? Oh, well, then we can get the audience in here a little bit, too. Let me ask perhaps two more questions and then open things up to the audience. Um, and I think your last comments would lead us logically to, or lead me logically to ask you questions about your tremendously effective and compelling outward-facing work. The editorials and op-eds uh, you write, you know, I'll often see, ah, Times in the New York Times, <laughs> uh, including about marriage and the Confederate flag um, and you name it. So. Uh, as you have been carrying um, out this brilliant, rigorously researched scholarship, uh, you have also been participating in a number of public debates. Uh, so let me just ask you a couple. Uh, the argument contained in the title of one, no Ben Carson, slaves weren't immigrants. <laughs> Ben Carson with practicing historical revisionism with a blunt instrument. <laughs> so, just to give the audience a couple of quotes from this piece, uh, the conditions under which individuals and groups came here on their own accord or were brought here against their will have had monumental consequences for our life chances and the evolution of our rights as citizens. Retrofitting a generic definition of the term immigrant to slavery strips both of their historical meanings. Immigrants are people who move in search of refuge and resettlement of their own volition. So perhaps there is nothing else to add, but, <laughs> uh, but yeah. if you like. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, so for me, um, this is me, the immigrant citizen. <laughs> you know, what else can you do? Like, what can you say? How can you marshal, you know, your resources as a scholar 
your skill set, mm -hmm. you know, as a writer, mm -hmm. to help the public grapple with some of the things that come before us that are so important mm -hmm. and so important about history and yet so misinformed mm -hmm. in the way in which <coughs> the larger discourse is often carried out. Mm -hmm. yeah. So for me, I see this as, you know, this is why I became a historian. This is my political work. <laughs> um, to be able to speak to those concerns about present day that have historical relevance. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so that's what sort of you know motivates the kind of writing that I do. And also just wanting to share more of the work that as historians we're all familiar with. So quite often what I'm saying, there, there's nothing like you know, new or but again, it is edifying for a public that is open to being edified. Right. Because you're obviously all aware of the extent to which you can marshal facts and you can place them before the the eyes of the public and there are people invested in just having their opinions about things that have no basis in fact. Right. Uh, including the question, uh, again, the argument contained in the question, who needs to be taught the dignity of work about black people who are lazy and won't work? I quote, the problem is not, nor has it ever been, that poor people don't value work, but that the employers and others devalue their humanity, as was evident in the case of the people who hire laundry workers and wherever poor working class <laughs> Uh, have plied their trade, including, I should say, well, a academics can't be regarded as poor working class people, but the labor conditions, which we don't talk nearly enough about, of, of, of certainly marginalized people within academia, um, would say something about who values, whose work, whose humanities, even in, in these work settings, but I digress. <laughs> The, um, the the question about work again. I think this was in response. Was it to um, Romney? I forget. Well, one of whoever was during a presidential campaign where once again we're being uh, the distinction is being drawn between the makers and the takers. <laughs> and so uh, Tara again weighs in. I guess it's pretty straightforward. But let me, before we open it up to the audience, ask this last question drawn from a piece you wrote about what you term the unrepentant confederacy. Uh, obviously, in light of our presence here in Charlottesville, Virginia, today and the uh, events of August 11th and 12th, uh, I'll ask you again to put your hat on uh, the political work that you do as a historian um, to comment in any way that interests you on, um, on those events. Mm -hmm. Well, actually, I just wrote a piece for the Princeton Alumni Magazine that's coming out in December about the Confederate Monument controversy. Oh. Um, and it's tied, we just have uh, Princeton, uh, Princeton and Slavery Symposium, so we have this big historical project. And we just had the symposium a couple of weeks ago. And so as a result of that project, we've come up with um, my colleague, Marnie Sandwise, is the director of the project, and she's worked with mainly undergraduates doing the research and a few graduate students basically going through the Princeton archives but other archives to look at the relationship between Princeton and slavery. And so one of the things that's really striking about the history that people didn't know, it was sort of like a lore, um, but it's now been documented, is how much white Southerners dominated Princeton. Mm -hmm. So Princeton has always been known as the Southern Ivy League. Um, and, but we had no idea how true <laughs> that was. Um, so in Princeton's history, it's between 40 and 60% of the student population was from the South. Um, on average, 40%, but as much as 60%. Um, and so that really shaped the, the history of the university. So in this case, I talk about um, how Princeton dealt with um, the controversy of 
the Civil War, for example. Princeton is known, it's very, you know, known for like its role in the Revolutionary War, being a place where the Continental Congress happened, and that's all part of like, you know, Princeton's wonderful history. But no one really talks about the Civil War. And so there is a monument in Nassau Hall, which is the administrative building. It's marble, and it has the names of all the men who fought in the Civil War. But it doesn't identify them by which side they fought on. And that was a deliberate decision by the president at the time, this was done around 1820, 21, to not identify them. So as to not sort of, you know, emphasize, you know, like brother against brother kind of conflict. But what's interesting about that is what that says about where the nation was in its attitudes about the Civil War. So there was this sort of national thinking about the Civil War in terms of reconciliation, downplaying it, you know, not really want to talk about like slavery, emancipation. But what's striking is how that differed from what happened right after the war in 1865 when Princeton memorialized students who had fought, and they made a very clear distinction um, that we are talking about the men who fought for the Union. We acknowledge that the, there were men who fought for the Confederacy, but it's not appropriate to more memorialize them because they were not fighting for a just cause. So to go from 1865 thinking about the Civil War in that way to 1920 says a lot about the nation, where the nation was, and how much Princeton was sort of represented in that nation. So anyway, in this piece I talk about that, but I also talk about the larger history of sort of memorialization. And so I think it's important for us to think about how, to, how, how did these monuments come into being? And again, historians know this history, but when did they come into being and why? And who, who basically erected these monuments and for what purposes? And we see these moments in history, the association with the rise of white supremacy, the association with um, the rise of the modern civil rights movement. Those are the peak moments when these um, monuments were erected. And the United Daughters of the Confederacy were the leading forces behind this project of revising the history of the Civil War such that slavery was a good thing and the Civil War had nothing to do with slavery. You know, the kind of, the whole lost cause ideology. Um, the explicit messages of white supremacy that are inscribed in many of these monuments. And yet, how much the nation really fed into it. So it's not just about the South. The thing that's so interesting about you know what's happening or what has happened here in Virginia is this could happen anywhere in the country. It just happens to be that Charlottesville was targeted, but these monuments are literally all over the country. From Massachusetts to California, there are very few states without monuments. There are states that didn't even exist at the time of the Civil War <laughs> that have monuments to Confederate soldiers. We have monuments in the halls of Congress. The federal government has signed on. But how does the federal government <laughs> sign on to celebrating the people, people who fought <laughs> against them, committed treason? Like, how does that happen? But we have the national, you know, the national cemetery. We have um, so much of the federal. Um, there's so much statutory. Um, Confederate memorials all over um, federally controlled and occupied parks and buildings and so on. And so I think as a country, we, we need to really grapple with the complicity of the unrepentant Confederacy because it's not just the South. Right. It's how basically everyone else has signed on to that narrative. And so the South lost the war, but in a certain way, it, it won ideologically, because it was able to incorporate, um, it was able to basically, um, to get the rest of the people to go, the rest of the white people to go along with a certain kind of narrative for the sake of national unity and reconciliation. And we've done that at the expense of African American people. 
Um, and so I think it's important that we recognize that. When we talk about what do we do, that's a debatable question. What do we do with these monuments? But we have to start from understanding how did they come to be. Wonderful response and a great place to open up the conversation to members of the audience. Please uh, raise your hand if you have a question. And Jen, should we get mics to people with questions? No? Okay. All right. Any questions? Yes, John. No, I just want to say hello, Tara. Hi, Jen. It's been a long time. Um, thank you so much for this conversation. It was absolutely wonderful. I just have a comment. Um, you, you ended on the lost clause, and I think here at UVA, we need to recognize that UVA was one of the students in the creation of the myth of the lost clause. Um, Edward Bullard, who right after the Civil War published a book called The Lost Cause, that revisionist idea of the Civil War as a glorious um, event that had nothing to do with slavery, was an alum of UVA. And, um, you know, so of course the nation needs to confront these, but um, I want to continue to remind us here that we also have a lot of work to do. Right, absolutely do. Thank you very much for that. And I would say other academic mm -hmm. scholars also, not just at UVA, mm -hmm. Columbia. <laughs> you know, um, um, the Dunning School, um, you know, you know, like the academic historians are, you know, have to be accountable for the kind of histories that Many people wrote, you know, some continue to write, but <laughs> uh, written in the past mostly, um, that has signed on to that, that narrative of the lost mm -hmm. cause. So, yeah. yeah. Yes. Thank you very much for this. Um, my question is a little bit uh, related more so to your more recent work on the World Bank, which is absolutely wonderful. Um, something that you, you said earlier struck me um, that historians shouldn't be afraid to access our imaginations but also understanding the ways in which accessing our own imaginations can be helpful in reading behind what the archives sometimes cannot offer us. Um, and so in your work with marriage, um, I think it's long overdue, I know there are a few scholars who have begun to peel back behind like, the heteronormative lens between African-American relationships. The works that come to me are like Cookie Bowler's work and Karen B. Hansen's article that was written in the 1990s. Um, mm -hmm. So, um, what recommendations would you have for those of us who are interested in the experiences of um, African American women, particularly who were not straight and not white, um, understanding their sexual desires uh, and the limitations, uh, understanding that <coughs> certainly there are institutional uh, bureaucratic records, I should say, that allowed you to write this book with marriage certificates and such, church records and so on. But how can we begin to uh, recover the stories of those women who perhaps didn't fit mm -hmm. conventional understandings of love, right. um, desire, and um, marriage? Mm -hmm. Well, I think, you know, there are people who are starting to do that work, have done that work. So you mentioned Karen Hansen's article um, um, that also includes um, Farrah Griffith's um, book. She's coming. Um, Farrah edited basically the letters um, between those, I don't know if you've seen those. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a, a collection of letters that came from the Hartford Historical Society. Um, and so those are rare letters. These are letters written between two African American women. Actually, it's just one side of the correspondence um, from the 19th century. Um, and so those are really rare in that they open up, you know, we see, uh, you know, we, we get to see a lot about like these two women's relationships, which seem to be homoerotic um, from the things that they say in the letter. So those are rare, and I don't know of any other sources from the 19th century that are like that. So I think not much has been done with those letters, for example. So I think that's one place to start. Um, there's a Queering Slavery Project that Jessica Johnson and other people are involved in that they're trying to really think about like, how do you think about slavery and queerness? Um, queer in a number of meanings of that term. Um, but I think you know the 20th century is more wide open. Jennifer Jones, where's Jennifer? She's working on her project. We talked to Jennifer about what she's doing. Um, it's not necessarily about families um, specifically, but I think um, scholars like Jennifer, uh, Jennifer are really starting to think a lot about um, queer sexuality 
and expanding the way we think about it historically. So I think that work is being done. So I would just encourage you, if you're interested in that, to you know to dive in and figure out how to contribute. Thank you. Yes. Um, Tara, I really am glad that you mentioned structural issues in terms of marriage. It's absolutely critical in terms of the mid 20th century. Um, but the one thing that you didn't mention in response to Deborah's question was I'm about ready on Monday to show Bill Moyer, Bill Moyer is well-intentioned but really problematic 1980s documentary, The Vanishing Black Family, in which it's all welfare, cultural poverty, underclass, um, sexual immorality, this is what's wrong with black people. Yeah. And so I would just wonder how you would sort of respond to that discourse that is still very much with us, even mm -hmm. after Tanner. Right, yeah. right. So, you know, that's, that's basically the point of this work. Yeah. I mean, that's, that video I've shown in my class as well, um, is it's basically our, an articulation of a Moynihan argument, like the pathology of the black family, um, you know, the black women as matriarchs. I mean, that's literally what that documentary um, portrays. And so that's, you know, it's, it's striking to me how much those ideas have lived on. Um, the Moynihan Report is not left us by any stretch of the imagination. It's seeped into our culture politically. Um, you know, our lawmakers think in those terms, policymakers, um, intellectuals, uh, on the right and the left think in those terms. And that's that may be more disturbing than anything else. It's that it's it's so it's so it's so normative now. Um, and that people actually are thinking about Moynihan even more favorably now, yeah. in some ways, and saying, well, was it, didn't it turn out to be that he was correct? Yeah. You, know, look at, you know, look at what he actually predicted. And so, um, so my book definitely pushes back against that. And you know, I try to um, not make Moynihan such a dominating force in the world, but it's hard to not, to not have him there at all. <laughs> because he is kind of a ghost that, um, or more than a ghost perhaps, that really seeps into the way the family's been talked about and continues to be talked about. So I, I really think that we have to do more and more work to push back against it. I think sociologists have been more favorable than historians um, in terms of accepting um, or reviving. There's been a push among sociologists to sort of revive what they see as his contributions in terms of thinking about structure. Mm -hmm. But you can't really leave out the other stuff. You can't isolate, oh, well, this is what we can say that Moynihan was trying to do that we can find useful. You've got to take it all in at the same time. And I think um, some sociologists are trying to sort of separate out what they see as the good, and I think that's problematic. Mm -hmm. What else? Any other questions or comments? Yes. Um, two <coughs> questions. One is, first of all, thank you for this amazing conversation. It's really inspiring. Um, one question has to do with the um, introduction of To Joy My Freedom, and I've wondered often how it's not a traditional introduction that engages the historiography, um, and I'm wondering if you could kind of talk about your decision to write the book in a different way, and what you see as the pros and cons of the way you did it, and if there was pushback that you received. I'm just kind of interested in the behind the scenes story mm -hmm. of that introduction. And the second question has to do with um, what I was really struck by when you talked about how you read the news African American newspapers twice. And how, and you can see in the work that that kind of research was done. And that's what makes your book what it is. But how, today, kind of the pressures that are being placed on academics to publish at such a fast rate, right? And to, you know, all of these pressures that are coming back to publish at such a fast rate and do so much else that we weren't expected to do before, do all this other stuff, plus have this kind of quick, quick, quick publication record. And how those structural constraints of academe are working against the kind of research that, I mean, only you could have written that book, but still it takes time, right. and then kind of just thinking about that tension. Right, so the intro came about, um, it was my editor's idea, which I like. Um, it's a prologue, and so it's a prologue that's also gotten me into trouble with historians, <laughs> um, because she asked me, she said, well, you know, do you have like a story that you can use 
like, no, I don't have one story. There's no one story that allows me to do what she wanted me to do, which basically sort of have a story that basically invokes the book. Right, it encapsulates, it encapsulates, it's, it's encapsulates the whole book. And I didn't have one story, so I had many stories, so I did a composite. Um, and so there's, there was definitely pushback against that. Um, but I also think that there's, there was pushback against not having a traditional introduction. I don't talk about historiography. Mm -hmm. And so for me, thinking about the book, um, thinking about an audience for the book, I was really interested in writing a book that people would want to read, who were not all academics. And so that, for me, was the most important reason why I didn't want to um, you know, make it a traditional this is where the literature fits. This is where, you know, the whole bit about the literature. Um, I also felt like they just, there wasn't much historiography to talk about in the first place. So why center historiography as opposed to the women? Like, so my point is, this is a book about these women. That's what I want to focus on. There, the historiography is in the footnotes, so it's not like, it's not what historians prefer. So I often get feedback and push back against, you know, why didn't you do a more traditional, you know, introduction? Now I will concede I should have done a conclusion. <laughs> I did not do a conclusion. So if I were going to redo it again, I, I would have done a conclusion. Um, I would say not all historians didn't like it because actually when it went out to readers, the two people who read it, um, Nell Painter and Dave um, Rodiger were the readers. They loved it. They were like, oh, do more of this, do more of this. But I think they're in the minority. Um, so, yeah. Well, alas, we have come to the end of our conversation. Uh, sorry. <laughs>